Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Physics Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. Today's episode is a rapid Q&A, but before we dive into things, I wanted to start with our newest segment, Reviews and Comments. To get you guys more involved into the podcast, each episode, we're going to read one comment left on Apple Podcasts, and our one comment actually left on YouTube videos from previous podcast episodes, and one review left on Apple Podcasts. This helps show our, not only our appreciation, um, but we want to be sure that we are answering your guys' questions that you are leaving on the podcast episodes. So the review is from Jay Wagner. And his review, I'll just read it. Incredible podcast that is a must listen. Coach Alex, Sue, and Austin share so much incredible insight that will teach you something new, but simultaneously make you feel better about what you are doing now. Thank you, Jay. Incredibly nice. Wow. Thank you. Jay, you know what you're, you. you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Um, and then the YouTube comment is from a Brian Garrity, which reminds me of the movie Big Daddy. That's um, <laughs> that is like the Adam Sandler movie. That's that I think that's his name in the movie, um, which makes me think that is this the real name? But nonetheless, Brian's question. Thank you for leaving the question. But Brian's question is: I have been taking glutamine at around five grams before and after my workouts. Am I wasting my time with that? And I've also been taking five grams of creatine. Uh, with my whey protein shake, can they work together or do I need to separate them? Uh, and basically, you know, is glutamine useful pre or post? Uh, so what do you guys think on that? Well, the creatine is definitely not useless. Uh, five grams post-workout, but the biggest thing with creatine is making sure that you are taking it daily because it does work off of saturation. Um, and if you want to have more info on what exactly creatine does, we will have a reel linked in the show notes going over the process of creatine just so that you guys are able to kind of visualize that and hear that. Um, but going into glutamine, Alex, there's some glutamine in our supplement cabinet is that a waste of space i wouldn't say it's a waste of space it depends on what your your overarching goal is going to be with the glutamine itself it's going to have a uh, greater benefit from a, a gut health perspective um, it's not going to be anything from like an anabolic uh, standpoint i shouldn't say no benefit but it's not going to be the overarching benefit that you're going to gain from the product in and of itself um, so it can be helpful from a, a gut lining perspective, but I wouldn't say that it's the a, a necessary component to it. In terms of how I use it with athletes myself is going to be, and I think that all three of us can agree here, is that um, I'll utilize it in a like a green shake within athletes in the morning and utilizing like 10 grams at that point to assist in, in gut health as a whole. Um, if you have anything other to, to add to that, Austin. I, yeah, no, I don't. I think that was covered well. And I, I think... It's just kind of like, you know, the conversation around BCAAs, right? They're not useless, but they probably are a luxury and they, they do get, they do get a bit more nuanced with their usage and it's very contextual to that individual, right? It's very situation dominant in terms of when to use it, when to not use it. Um, you know, it's probably more of a luxury. So yeah, that's all I'd add to that for sure. Cool. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Brian, um, for contributing and engaging. Uh, we're very grateful for that. And if you would like us to read your questions or reviews on the podcast, uh, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or leave a comment under a, a YouTube video or podcast on, uh, on YouTube. Yeah, and we'll read that and feature you on the podcast. So thank you guys again. And with that, we will get into today's episode. So question one. Austin, upper back pull down seem hard to progress in in terms of load. Why is that? Yeah, we were kind of talking about this and having a conversation before we hit record. And, you know, it's it's one of those movements where it, this could be actually come down to paralysis by analysis, where you're, you're maybe thinking too much about it, where upper back pull downs is one of those things where, you know, if your setup's good, you're in a good position, it's sort of kind of like a grip it and rip it exercise. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, you're in a safe position, um, you know, as long as you are set up in a good position, you should be able to really just kind of work through that, you know, given range of motion through that movement pattern and kind of just, yeah, grip it and rip it. So, um, you, it may come down to your overthinking it. I agree. 
<laughs> you guys agree? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. So which PT certification is best, Sue, among things like the NSCA, NASM, ACE, et cetera? Well, my opinion on these is that there isn't necessarily a, this one is the magic answer for you to be the best personal trainer. A lot of becoming a great personal trainer or a great online coach comes after that certification. I kind of look at those certifications as the base. That's like you went to kindergarten, congratulations, you have that base. And then past that is where you really fine tune things. Because when we're looking at these accredited uh these accredited places, they're great, 100%. I have my certification through ACE. Um, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm glad I did it. But it's also something where you have to look at anything that is ongoing research is not something that's going to be in these courses. The information that's coming out is coming out in troves, and it's not in a place that they can get it into the curriculum automatically within any accreditation. And so it's something where having any of these is going to be of benefit fit to you, but truly putting in the work past your certification is what matters. If you just get your certification and you maintain it and that's all you ever do, you're doing a major disservice to your clients and to yourself. And that doesn't mean that now you have to get 17 letters after your name. It's more so you continue being alert. You continue being a student. You continue consuming information from seminars, from other coaches, from mentors, from places like N1 whatever that may be, being able to constantly consume information in that regard is going to be much more important than what those letters are. The only place that it necessarily matters is if you're getting a job at a place and they do require one certain certification where I know like lifetime, I believe requires you to have NASA. I could be incorrect on that. I believe that's, <laughs> that's the answer. So that's the only time I believe it personally matters. But what matters more is what you do past that. Yeah, I think it's a great answer. And with certifications in general, just really, really quick, um, I will I will keep this brief. Um, I think if you don't have a university degree in the specific area, it's that much more important for you to try and get one of these certifications, right? Because um, it, it gets you exposed to that sort of foundational information that you otherwise would have been exposed to in that, you know, maybe that exercise science degree or some sort of degree in a health profession. Um, so it's not required you have a university degree in that area, but I think if you don't, it is valuable for you to go ahead and have a certification because it sort of gets you into that information that you maybe not, you maybe wouldn't come across otherwise. Um, and when it comes to this stuff, you are actually really impacting people's health. So it, it's something you should probably take you know, pretty seriously and something that I would always recommend to people if you can do it. Yes. And I know some coaches have said that because a certification isn't necessary or they've learned so much past the certification, even though I have personally learned so much past my certification, I do not regret getting it because it's something like Austin said, I built that foundation. And the point is to have that to continue to improve on, not that it's null and void because I've learned more past it. Um, because we can all agree, we've probably learned a lot past school and doesn't mean that school is complete completely useless to us. So going into the next question here, how do you determine volume for muscle groups, Alex? So this is a, a very multifaceted question as a whole. There's going to be many prerequisites to address prior to uh, assessing this. And I would encourage all of you or the individual who asked this question uh, to purchase Austin's book would be a, a good place to kind of start here. Um, just a general plug there. But then you want to look at the training experience of the individual or training experience of yourself. And then you want to look at your ability to execute within the movements that you've selected or the muscle groups that you're wanting to improve upon. Um, and then from there, you want to assess how frequently you're able to train in those different factors. And now we want to be able to spread the volume across however many days you're wanting to train. And I would say a general kind of foundation of um, sets that you could utilize per muscle group is going to be in the window of eight to 12. And so that's going to be kind of your, your general you know, bottom line set volume. Now, within that, this is going to be different of how are you utilizing the different variables of the repetitions that you're performing, the rest periods that you are allotting, the tempo that you're utilizing. So there's a lot of variables to utilize. And I know that I'm throwing a lot of information at the individual who asked this, but this is truly how my brain works. And so I'm giving you my 
my honest answer on this front. But within this, I would say that eight to 12 sets is a good place to start. And then titrating that up, depending on your recovery, where your nutrition is at, um, you know, how your recovery is transpiring, all those different factors are going to play a big role. And I'm turning this more into like a full podcast in and of itself and no longer a rapid fire. (laughs) Um, Okay, next question. I hope that's helpful. Is that can we skip lunges and still achieve decent legs, Austin? You know, you can. I (laughs) skipped lunges most of my career. (laughs) My, My legs, I would say, are categorized as decent, nothing more, <laughs> nothing less. So, um, yeah, no, you can, you absolutely can. And, and there really isn't a requirement for exercises. I, I think there are kind of those steadfast exercises that are good to perform. Um, they train a lot of tissue. They train a good amount of your balance and coordination. Um, and lunges, you can think of more of a progression onto things like split squats or stationary lunges. So a walking lunge, rather things that you're moving like a forward lunge or a walking lunge, things you're moving forward and actually uh, mobile during the lunge, you can think of more of as a progression to things like stationary split squats, uh, stationary lunges, which is the the same thing. And also lunges or split squats, stationary using a cable, right? These are kind of regressions from a lunge. So again, tons of things, tons of ways to train your legs. Um, and, and honestly, I think the more beginner you are and depending on the phase, you may be better with a a safer environment to, to move more load. And that's where things like leg presses and hack squats and, uh, those type of machines come into play. And, and, you know, if you're trying to get really strong, then that's probably better than a, a walking lunge, right? If you're trying to build up a lot of strength in your legs. So, um, yeah, lunges aren't absolutely necessary by any means. Perfect. So how long should metabolic and neurological phases be if your main goal is hypertrophy, Alex? It depends. You want to stay in those two phases as little as possible. Um, the neurological phases are going to have a, a little bit of, and I should say this, is that you can kind of blend the two. And so kind of breaking the rules and utilizing a little bit of neurological uh, training blended in with hypertrophy. And you can do a little bit of metabolic training blended in with hypertrophy, kind of breaking the rules a little bit. So I think that in a hypertrophy based, you know, phase or or wanting to create the most muscle growth as possible. The easy answer is you want to spend as little time, uh, to kind of deload from the hypertrophy stimulus, utilizing the neurological based training and the metabolic based training. And so if I could give you a week's allotment, the metabolic training could be maybe two to three weeks in duration. And then the neurological based phases could be four weeks. And I know that those are like hard, fast numbers, but at the same time, um, it's going to be dependent on you and what the biofeedback looks like and how you're recovering and and how you're looking. And those different factors are going to play a huge role as well. Yeah. And don't be afraid to change your game plan if the biofeedback changes, because there's been times where I've been in a phase and Alex has pulled it early or left it in longer just due to how I'm responding. So don't go by those hard and fast numbers. Use that as a guideline and then apply what else you know within that. And that's going to be that's that like elongating phases, shortening phases is going to come from repetitions. It's not like I just like read a book and this was the answer. It was like, oh, okay, Sue followed this and this and this. And so this is why I cut it short. It was because I've had you know thousands of examples to go through. And now I've been able to kind of uh, collect the data and then make that decision because of X, Y, and Z factors. And I have all the data for her specifically. And I've written her training for years at this point. So don't feel as though like, well, I elongated this one too, too much, or I shortened this one uh, early or whatever. It, those errors are going to transpire and you're just going to learn from those. So don't feel as though you've failed or, or done something wrong. It's, it's more of just getting repetitions. That was a great point. Faux show. <laughs> um, the, the next question I believe is for Sue, if I'm on, I, I'm on the mm-hmm. right page here. Okay. How many steps should you take if you work a desk job? What about for fat loss benefits of, of having a step count in general? So within this, it depends. Um, For a desk job or for steps in general, I do have a post on Instagram um, about 10K steps and where it came from. And the big thing I want you to take away from it, I'll have it linked in the show notes as well, is that that metric was made by a pedometer um, company 
just because it was catchy and just because the symbol for 10K um, in Japanese, which is where it originated, looks or the symbol for walking looks like 10K or something to that effect. It's it's all in the post. Uh, but basically, it is not a metric that you need to abide by 100%. It's not that everyone needs to hit 10K steps or 10K is this magic number. At the end of the day, movement is good for you and you need to be able to apply that to what you're doing in your life. So what I would say, instead of me giving you a hard and fast number for what you should do as a desk job, is try to look at what your average steps are now and then try increasing it by one to 4,000 or 1,000 for a few weeks and then another thousand for a few weeks and see how you feel and how you're going off of that. I know for me, I can very easily with working a desk job only get 2,000 steps a day. And I know I don't feel my best when I'm getting 2,000 steps a day. But I also don't always feel my best when I'm getting 10K plus a day. When I get over 10K, I start to have my hips hurt, honestly. Uh, I'm not, um, it it makes me not feel my absolute best. And so it is something where I have a, I started with my minimum step goal being about 6K, made sure that I could accomplish that. Then we bumped it up to 8K as far as where my minimum is at. So that's how I would recommend applying that. As far as fat loss, that's kind of how I want to loop in the benefits of step counting. So step counting, of course, if you get overwhelmed by metrics and all these numbers you have to abide by, it might not be the best metric for you. But what I will say about a step count is it's a very easy way to track your activity. Most of us have some sort of watch or fitness tracker, whether it's an aura ring, a Fitbit, a I don't remember the other names, an Apple Watch, whatever it may be, or your phone. Your phone has the health app on it. And if you're carrying your phone with you, you're able to track your steps. Um, And so it is something, and the health app is free. Um, It is something where most of us have a way to track that metric of steps. Um, And so it is something where it's very easy to track instead of tracking minutes. Sometimes you'll hear guidelines of like, oh, you should move 150 minutes a week. But let's say I'm walking to from my car in a parking lot, or I'm going to walk my dog, or I'm going outside to play with my kid or whatever it may be, um, you're not going to be like, oh, let me set a timer real quick and make sure I'm adding all this up over multiple days. It's much easier to be like, hey, I'm going to have this step count and I'm going to try and reach that. Um, So that's one thing is it's an easier metric to track. Um, And then the other aspect of this, especially when it comes to fat loss, is inherently as you lower calories, you move less. So whether that's if you're watching this on YouTube, you see me moving my hands. I'm animated with my hands when I talk. I'm animated with my face. When I'm dieting, I'm deadpan and I don't move. Um, And that goes into your needs, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And so it could be something that let's say that you're at a certain calorie count, you lower that calorie count. So you're down like 150 calories a day, but then you move less as well and you don't see any weight loss. It could, it's not that, oh, I need to lower my food again. It could be that you just need to maintain a certain step or a certain movement because inherently you move less when you're dieting, when you have less calories. And so that's something I would highly recommend to keep in mind because you could be cutting food when you just need to make sure you're moving your body a little bit more to maintain those results so you're not having to bottom that food out. Sick. Yeah. Okay. The next question is in a fat loss phase and you're wanting to, or you have to travel for work. Should I follow my program or stop Sue? So it depends on what you want to do with your goals and how fast you need to reach them. Um, When it comes to traveling, it is extremely doable to travel and stay on track. Alex and I have been away from home more weekends than we've been home. It has been a crazy year of travel and I have been able to stick to my macros and stick to my goals. Of course, there's some flexibility in that because I'm in an improvement season and there's no reason for me to be super the way that I would be in prep, basically. There's no reason for that. And so I have had some flexibility, but I've still been able to hit my goals. And if I used being out of town or traveling every time, I would not see any of the results that I've seen this year. So it really depends on what effort you're wanting to put in and what your expectations are and recommend matching your effort to your expectations. If you're going on vacation, 
then decide if you do or don't want to track or have some sort of goal. And no, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, There's times where we've gone on vacation and I haven't trained, but I've still gotten walks every day or I haven't tracked, but I've still been cognizant of hitting a certain protein goal per meal of like, yeah, this is roughly 25 grams of protein. I'm good to go for this meal, Um, whatever that may look like. So no, it doesn't have to be I'm either tracking everything or I'm tracking nothing, but also being able to look aside your goals and what you want to accomplish and what that time frame looks like and putting together a game plan. What I wouldn't recommend is going into that travel without a plan or without having a little bow wow with yourself or pow wow. Don't know why I said bow wow. Um, a little pow wow with yourself of, hey, what do I want to accomplish and what am I willing to put effort forth within this? And then going ahead and doing that um, because that's going to be much more important than me telling you to start or stop because it doesn't matter. To maintain is not to regress. I think that's an important note. Um, And something is usually better than nothing, especially when it comes to improving or maintaining your health. So don't feel bad. So we want to, okay, we're going to go on to, we're going to stick with Sue if she's up for it. Sure. Your voice voice up for it. All right. (laughs) Let's do the, can you have fats before training and how before, how I guess how long before training are fats okay? Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was how are fats okay before training or how long. Um, Yes, you can have fats before training. So the big thing with this is looking at how much fat you have in a day. So for example, let's say that you have 40 grams of fat. Um, If you were to have 20 grams pre or post workout, I would probably recommend you to space that out a little bit more because they're going off of percentages as far as fat. I recommend to have for clients for their fat percentage to be five to 15% for their pre or post workout. The reason people say no fats or only carbs and protein are prioritized that pre and post workout is because the, um, protein, you want that for your muscle recovery, of course, um, and you want to build strong muscles, but the carbs are going to be for the energy that you need within that training session. And protein and carbs digest faster than fats. Fats and fiber digest slower. And so it is something that if you eat fats and you eat it really close to your workout, you might still be trying to digest that. But while you're training, your blood is being pulled away from your stomach to go to your big, strong muscles to move the weight and um, work on that perceived stress that's happening, which is you lifting those weights. So it could feel like a rock is sitting in your stomach or you're not digesting your food or you just don't feel as energized because it's not moving through you in the same way. Um, So that's the big thing is it can slow down that food digesting, which means it can slow down that energy getting to you before your training. It can slow down that recovery post-training within having a, a larger amount of that in regard to how much you have total. So let's say you have 100 grams of fat that you're eating in a day obviously you're not going to go zero pre-workout, zero post-workout, and then try to have a million grams of fat in your other meals. That would be very uncomfortable. So it's something where you kind of have to apply it to what you're personally going through or what your personal macros are and how that works within you, as well as a little bit of trial and error of how you feel when you're training or how you feel post-training when you do have more fats or less fat or different food sourcing as a whole, because fats from a Pop-Tart might sit in you different than having fat from an avocado or something like that. So being able to pay attention, reflect and troubleshoot. On that note, that's not to say that Pop-Tart fats are bad and no. avocado fats are good. It's more of just how they digest for you specifically, yes. just to clarify that. One's healthier than the other, let's be honest. Right, right. I mean, it is, but I'm just more so saying that, um, yeah. Good the point. There's no reason yes. to demonize the food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex is very protective of his Pop-Tarts, okay? Yeah, don't, be, don't talk don't bad about Pop-Tarts. About Pop-Tarts yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, body built by Pop-Tarts. If it, I mean, no, for if you're talking about Pop-Tarts probably really, really were a part of the inception of the company in general. So <laughs> truth still are a big part. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, they're what on were, our grocery list what every were week. The, uh, what were the ice cream sandwiches that we used to eat? Oh, skinny cows. Yeah, skinny cows. Oh my gosh. The very overpriced, just basic ice cream sandwiches that we used to inhale. Um, those were part of the inception as well. They do have like two or three less fats per right. serving, which we thought was <laughs> the biggest deal ever. So it's like, yeah, these are these yeah. are the goat right here. Oh, secret to muscle that's so growth. funny. <laughs> Let's chat amenorrhea, Alex. So define it first um, and then does it hinder muscle growth? 
Yes. So this is going to be a, a loss of cycle or, or lack thereof of, of hormonal harmony is what we'll call it. Um, and, and many women are going to experience this from a, a, a plethora of different facets, whether that be, it's, it's generally from stress on the body. So when we define stress on the body, it's going to be uh, many different factors, whether that be from uh, your work environment or a relationship environment, the uh, training stress that you're putting on yourself, the uh, distance running, those different factors, low calorie consumption, a lot of different things can can cause this. And, and I think that a good analogy uh, that's a little bit more drastic for individuals to understand is that if a male is, is very low uh, testosterone, let's say that his uh, scoring for his total testosterone is roughly around 100, which is going to be very low for those that are not familiar with hormonal panels. A, a good scoring for a total testosterone for a male is going to be between 700 and 1,000. And so things that are going to um, transpire for the male that's scoring between 100 to 200, even below 100, is that they're going to uh, accrue body fat significantly faster. They're going to lose strength quite rapidly. They're going to have a very hard time putting on muscle, very hard time recovering, uh, not being able to sleep those different factors. And what's interesting with individuals who have lost their cycle or females who have lost their cycle, a lot of those same things are transpiring, but it's just in a more drastic uh, visual with males because of the large um, gap between a, uh, a male's testosterone. Whereas with a female, we're talking like tens of, of that testosterone, or we're looking at progesterone and estradiol and um, DHEA and, and many of the other factors. And so, yes, it is going to, to cause issues within muscle gain. Now, is it impossible to put on muscle tissue? No, but it is going to be uh, significantly more difficult depending on the um, severity of the, the loss of the cycle itself. And within that, I guess another analogy would be that if you were to go into a hundred meter race, uh, not having your cycle and, and the hundred meter races is, is you, uh, wanting to put on muscle tissue. It's kind of like having a 25 pound weight attached to your ankle and trying to run with this thing. And you're next to, um, I don't know, someone, Shikari. yeah, Shikari or, or one of the, the, the women from Jamaica, Jamaica. <laughs> just absolutely torching you running like a, a seven second, hundred meter. <laughs> I don't think women are at seven seconds yet, but to men aren't either. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be kind of a, uh, an analogy for you to utilize there. So if you are struggling with your menstrual cycle, I would encourage you to put all of your efforts into regaining your cycle first and having consecutive cycles, looking at blood panels to make sure everything is very crisp before you make a big push to put on muscle tissue. Um, that would be my my pitch for your overall internal health uh, yeah. before you wanted to put on muscle tissue. Yeah, and if you have to think your body works in harmony, so if something is off internally, then it's going to be harder to do the things that you want to do. So whether that is fat loss or muscle gain or whatever it may be, if you have levels off internally, then that can cause things to be off as a whole. Um, so it's not just applying to women losing their cycle, but like Alex said, of men having lower testosterone testosterone or just having a value off internally that can affect how your body processes things because so many things are interrelated. Sick. Okay. So all of us are going to speak on this. And uh, the first question is favorite exercises for glutes. If we want to give kind of a top two or three, we can kind of run through that. Well, mine would be the glute focus to leg press. Okay. Split squats are awful. And so are barbell <laughs> hip thrusts. So don't come for me. Yeah, those are, um, those are, yeah, those are pretty garbage. They're fantastic <laughs> yeah. exercises, but they're trash to do, um, or to perform. Um, I think some sort of, I love, I love the RDL. I know I talk about it so much on the show. Um, but I love the RDL and I, I think the hip banded probably RDL is, is probably going to be my go-to glute for myself just cause it does help train throughout a, a pretty large range of motion. And I still get to lift heavy weights and, um, you know, I, I, I feel good when I do it. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the, the women who have the best results in terms of growth are going to be RDLs and then the split squats. I, I apologize, oh. but the split squats are probably going to be the big dog there. Trust. And just to, to, just to appease everyone listening the the hip thrust or glute bridge is still a great movement, but in terms of like muscular growth, 
that's not going to be your your massive driver. Your RDLs, your split squats are going to be much larger drivers uh, than the hip thrust itself. I also like the 45 degree hip extension. Yeah. Did you say your, oh yeah, you said your favorite. Yeah, he was one of the right, women you quads? said. He was one of the women that, <laughs> yeah, in that group. I was just saying in reference to programming. <laughs> He's one of the women he was talking about. Yeah. Yes. For quads, I really love leg extensions. Yeah, leg extensions No are split awesome. squats for me there either. Split squats are awesome there again too. <laughs> they are awesome, but I just personally don't enjoy them. I still do them. Trust me, he programs them, but. For my short little legs, I really like, um, <laughs> I like hack squats. I like oh my heel. gosh, I love hack squats. Yeah, I think hack squats, um, leg extension, and if you want to make a combo, you could do a hack squat leg extension into an assault bike all out sprint, <laughs> and you can murder yourself. So and you'll, your quads will be so big after that, you won't be able to walk through a door. So yeah, you won't um, be able to flex. You won't be able to. Do, you would need like I two just sets of that. Mentally to went through that and got a little tired. So yeah, it's good times. <laughs> would recommend. All right. The next question is, what is your favorite rep scheme or rep range to train in? Uh, four to six for me. Yeah. <laughs> Around that four to six, sometimes going into eight, but I like it at six. I am just going to go against the grain here. I'm, I agree You're with you both. You're a dead liar if you go I know, anything that's, else. Just, just calm down. <laughs> Alex himself, if there's like more than six reps, he's like, oh, I'm just so much stronger at six. I'm going to stay here. And I'm like, that's kind of the point. <laughs> anyway, uh, the roast can end. Um, I will say that I enjoy a descending rep scheme of like 10, 8, 6, 4. I like that. I also like wave loading of like 8, 6, 4, and then getting to challenge myself in the second wave of like getting to increase the load just to go against the grain instead of us all saying 4 to 6 is our favorite. Well, it can all be our favorite. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> How to improve your networking within the industry? Pretty loaded question, honestly. Um, but I think it starts, I'll open up the conversation with that. I think it starts with being just genuinely in a, a interested kind person who's engaged in into a conversation right whether that's a broad or specific conversation and from there i think you can very easily participate in conversations and engage with people that really helps form relationships pretty easily yeah i mean think of how many of all of us hate cold sales you hate when someone random DMs you and asks you, um, like, do you want to join this or should we collab on this? It's like, I, I've never had any communication with you. So what my advice would be is to like authentically communicate with people, authentically consume others' content that you do want to collaborate with or that you do want to create a network with. Anyone that we have personally with NPD created a network with has not started with, oh, I'm trying to like just have something and have our names together so that our audiences all um, like overlap. It's more so of building relationships and then being able to build that network bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper because with building those relationships, you'll see what direction you want to go within that network. So um, for ways to do that, if you're in the bodybuilding community, going to shows is huge. Um, but even just interacting with people, if you don't know how to start a conversation, make it a genuine comment, not just like, oh, yes, girl, or oh, believe that, <laughs> like truly respond to the yeah, questions Alex, they're asking seriously. on their Instagram, whether it be in a caption or on a story. If you comment something thought provoking or you ask something back, that's where that networking is going to start to take hold. Um, and I have found that that's much more a much more sustainable network than just trying to reach out to anyone within your sphere and try to network that way. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add just valuing people's time. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're going to to reach out, be willing to, to pay whatever fee it is to have that hour consultation with whomever you're wanting to meet with or what have you, um, just really value people's time and, and, and be direct and, and those different factors. And um, 
just be yourself as well. I, I think that one thing that individuals uh, kind of get caught up in, especially as they're getting into you know coaching or just into fitness in general, is that they feel like they have to fit some specific mold. And um, I, I think that I potentially felt that way when we first got things going you know, s- seven plus years ago. And, and now we, we're having the greatest success that we've ever had. And it's more so just because we've we've done what we've wanted to do. We've, we've been ourselves and um, we've been able to connect with individuals, incredible individuals, solely off of them being um, great people and, and, and just aligning with us and those different factors. So I think being yourself and valuing everyone's time is is very important. And supporting their success. It's something that if you are constantly a little bitter about things, they're not really going to want to network with you or care to share information with you. A lot of the relationships that we've built have come from just being genuine, interacting, supporting them and their cause, and then being able to have deeper conversation and deeper connection past that. Sick. I don't know why I keep using yeah, that I was as about my to say, that's Whatever. At the end of every set. I've said that twice now, but hey. All <laughs> right. Next one. What are the ideal characteristics you guys want to see in your clients? Uh, yeah. I like uh, just open communication. I, I think that's a big one. Um, honesty. And I think open communication and, and a client being honest and, and willing to, to do the things that they prob- promise this, themselves that they would do. Um, I, I think it's those three things for me are big because I can work around a lot. I can work around, you know, adherence, cons- consistency. I can work around different, you know, whatever challenges come up. Um, obviously we all can, but it comes down to being open, being, uh, being able to communicate, being honest with that communication and be, just be, to the, to the most foundational sense, just keep the promises you make to yourself. And there's a lot that can happen there. I can definitely second that. Um, And I would say that just clients that truly can realize um, and reflect on themselves, a coach can do as much as they can, but I can't personally do things for you. And so it's something of being able to reflect on what you've accomplished and truly take that step forward instead of thinking, hey, I hired a coach, all of my dreams are going to come true. Um, And being able to see, okay, what do I want to accomplish? Am I putting in that effort? Am I matching those expectations? Because that is absolutely huge. Um, And being able to kind of reflect on, hey, what are my expectations? And again, are my efforts matching that to be able to reach that goal? Um, Because like Alex said, as far as valuing someone's time, as a coach, I pour into my clients and I want to give, give, give. But if I'm getting nothing in return, no, no trying, no doing anything, then that is very, very difficult um, as a coach. And it's hard to continue to pour into people. So I would say pouring into yourself as much as you're pouring into that service, valuing your own time and valuing your coach's time. I will agree with all those. And then I will add clarity. So, so having a clear idea of what you're wanting to accomplish and then, um, within whatever the goal is and, and understanding what that's going to take. So that's going to be from, from both parties, but understanding, um, whatever that goal is and having that clarity work ethic, obviously is going to be a big component of this as well as, um, as, kind of humorous as this is, but, but common sense within it all as well, <laughs> utilizing your, your noggin to kind of navigate different things and not expecting your coach to handhold you through some of the things that it's just like, wow, I really wish that you would have just understood that, you know, just from the general sense. I didn't think I had to say that out loud thing. Sick. Sick. <laughs> noggin utilization. I think it's great. If you could only have one piece from your home gym, what would it be? Um, one piece it's it's hard to say between or even of the stuff that we're adding on slash ordered yeah none of that stuff would be like my okay for sure but i would say the prodigy rack would be the number one thing but then it's like when you say the prodigy rack then you're like well then you also have to have a barbell but then you also have to have a bench then you also have to have the plates but the prodigy rack is going to be something from prime for those that are not familiar the prodigy rack is going to be a a cable system that also offers you the ability to um, have a squat rack i think that if you have all the pieces that come with it it's a hundred plus exercises that can be performed on it um it's a i mean it's 
quite literally, I think that the best in its space, like, I don't think that there's something that's comparable mm -hmm. to it. Um, I am, I think all three of us are very biased to, to prime in general, but at the same time, I don't think that there's anyone that even competes with them, um, within the, the prodigy rack itself. Yeah. Um, so I'd say the prodigy rack. And then, uh, if we, like, if we didn't have the, the rack for the dumbbells, I would say having adjustable dumbbells to whatever, you know, uh, strength level that you would have, if you need them to up to a hundred, I think that, um, they may there's like a set that maybe goes up to 110 that may be kind of the threshold there but adjustable dumbbells the prodigy rack you would have basically almost everything taken care of i would add the um so i would do the prodigy rack adjustable dumbbells and prime did, did just come out with that multiple uh the le leg extension lying leg curl combo unit so that's one piece that doesn't take up a lot of space at all um very low real estate in terms of your gym space so that knocks out two rain, you know, two movements that are all nearly impossible to recreate to that degree without the machine, right? Leg extension and lying leg curl. So, um, I think that's a, definitely a go. If I had to pick three, it'd be the prodigy rack, the lying leg curl, leg extension combo from prime and then adjustable dumbbells from wherever you could find them at this point. So, right. Yeah. I, I mean, I just love everything that we have in our gym right now. The stuff that we're adding on is more fun stuff. Um, but having like, I think someone asked me on a question box, what's our ideal equipment for a client to have? I love when a client has like cables, dumbbell and barbell, because with cables, that gives us a lot of extra exercises that you can't just do and changes the resistance of things that you can do with a dumbbell and barbell, but also alleviates some spinal loading there of not having everything be with a dumbbell or barbell and also give you some variety within exercises. Um, but then if you're adding on something, again, that lying leg curl um, and leg extension combo is great because you, you can't really hit that in other ways. Um, the leg extension is literally one of the only exercises that you can hit a fully shortened quad in. Um, and so it is something that if you don't have that, it makes training a little bit more difficult in that regard. So Prodigy Rack seems to be the winner. All things prime. Sick. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys for tuning in if you have any um reviews we'd love to read them on the next podcast from your apple podcast review or comment on our youtube um and then we also have a google um or a sheet in the show notes of if you have any feedback for us or if you have any suggestions for topics that you want us to cover and if you don't follow any of us on social media our social media tags are there because we often do question boxes for the podcast on our social media so thank you guys again so much i hope you learned something um, and we'll catch you on the next one see ya bye